No, thank you. Sleepy. You come back in an hour. Need sleepy. Please go away. Let me sleep for the love of God. It's now time for the Billy C. Morning Show, part of the Billy C. Boxing Network. Interact with the show at BillyCBoxing.com. And we're coming to you live from the Chili Studios in Lake George, New York. I'm Bill Caliger, and it's time for the Billy C. Morning Show. Almost forgot where I was. Today's show. Oh, oh wait. Let's let's okay. Can we start that over? I can. Uh, all right, all right. We're coming to you live from the Billy C Studios in Lake George, New York. I'm Bill Calagero, and it's time for the Billy C Morning Show. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing uh, okay. Today's show is being brought to you in part by Sal's Neighborhood Pizzeria, an Italian restaurant located in beautiful St. Simon's Island, Georgia. Uh, despite the hurricane, it's back, it's there, it's up, the island that is. Check it out, www.salsneighborhoodpizzeria.com or give my man a call, 912-268-2328, 912-268-2328. And don't forget, if you're heading south or sud, if you're from Canada, uh, it's 15 minutes off of I-95. Make the trip. Use the bathrooms. Do what you got to do at Sal's. But trust me, it'll be worth your time. And if it's not, let me know because I'll be shocked. And by the way, if you mention Sal uh, on this show, he'll throw you a free cannoli as long as you get something else to eat. www.salsneighborhoodpizzeria.com. Today's show is also being brought to us in part by my book, Tom Molino from Bondage. The baddest man on the planet. It's available right now where all good books are sold. Find out why we got a five, one, two, three, four, five star rating across the board. And uh, you can literally get a copy of it right now by visiting barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. Now, don't forget, I'm doing a book signing. There's a uh, book uh, fair. Uh, A lot of other authors are going to be there as well. So you get a a chance to... uh, a look at and uh, pick up some great books up in Glens Falls, New York at the Queensberry Hotel, Sunday, November 6th. I'll be there from uh, 10 a.m. until around 2 p.m. Uh, so if you want to uh, pick up a copy at a discount price, sign, talk a little boxing or whatever, stop by and see me. Uh, I'll have a table uh, up at the Queensberry Hotel on November 6th. Um don't forget, coming up a little bit later, uh, we got uh, some emails uh, that I'm going to read and give you my thoughts on. Uh, we may get time to uh, read a quote I was talking about yesterday from Jim Lampley on the PBC, which is right on. Uh, normally, I don't agree with Jim Lampley that much. Um, we got a Tyson Fury update with the WBO. Don't forget Tamara. Tamara, our blast from the past, features former world champion and boxing Hall of Famer Eddie Perkins. Uh, we'll talk about him. Uh, We also got uh, uh, Boxing Hall of Famer and New Jersey Athletic Commissioner uh, Larry Hazard scheduled to join us. Uh, But joining us right now, the man, the myth, the legend himself. He's a New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. He's a Guinness Book of World Record holder. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sal Rocky. Senecola. What's up, Sal? <laughs> Billy C., good morning. How are you today, my buddy? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. Uh, glad to hear you're uh, home, safe, and don't have to have a wetsuit on uh, in uh, uh, in lieu of the hurricane damage. And uh, we were just talking off the air. You said uh, it looks like uh, a ghost town there. You know, people, if you've never been to St. Simon's, they got the most beautiful and gigantic trees on the island. Sal, are a lot of them down? Well, it's nature's way of pruning these trees. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, uh, tree huggers here who uh, you, you, you have uh, to really, really be very careful and maintain the beauty of these hundreds of year old trees that are so big. And you're not allowed to touch a twig uh, on them. However, when nature says, hey, enough is enough, I got to prune you. Yeah, a lot of them are down, a lot of limbs. And these limbs crash and yards and everything else so 
it's nature's way of pruning, if I'm going to say that and be so bold. But, uh, yeah, we uh, we lost a lot of trees. In fact, I, you know, I, I'm on the island right now. I, I could tell you this. I, I'm, I'm all... I'm, I'm the only one, I think, on the north end of the island in this condo association. My, I have the only car here. It's devastating. You know, my, my buddy Max, our pie guy, he's been uh, on the island. He weathered the storm, so to speak, and he's been able to quarterback, you know, the uh, and doing some uh, live uh, Facebook announcements and stuff and streaming stuff and on the conditions of the weather here and the, the, the debris. And literally last night, it was pitch black driving up. I didn't see a soul. Uh, I didn't see a car. It's ear I felt I was on the set of The Walking Dead. And <laughs> well, you know, I, I tell you, so since no one else is around, we won't have to worry about the, your lawn guys hey, cutting the you lawn. Got no freaking, you know, you know, no I, landscapers. I, I, won't, I won't have to worry about that. You know, the one thing I wanted to ask you, and, and I know my man Coach, who's in the chat room, he's been uh, to your uh, restaurant, and uh, anyone else that's uh, listened, I know we got a lot of listeners that have been there. Uh, I, my big question is that tree that kind of grows right in between your roof and uh, and the other roof line. How is that? Did that did any damage from that big giant tree? Let me tell you, that damn thing's hanging on. <laughs> I, I think we should put some cement brackets up there and how and maybe uh, uh, put a paper mache or some coating around it. I'm telling you, that tree is so huge, so large. It's unbelievable. It's probably hundreds of years old. And every year when I renew my insurance package, I mean, I spend about $15,000 a year between flood insurance, between this insurance. And I sold insurance for many years, but I did life and personal lines. This is called property and casualty insurance. And my broker comes in every year and and he, he I get the angst because every time I check the list, okay, do I need this policy? Do I need that policy? And oh, they got you. You can have a wind policy, but it's not for a hurricane wind. It's for this. You want a storm? You got to have that. You want a, a, a rain, but you want a flood insurance. You can't do this, but anything above the flood, look, get that. So you got to get different policies. There's so much rhetoric, so much bull, so much hypocrisy with these policies. Now I know why people go crazy with insurance. Then every year, the last policy he brings up, he says, Sal, I strongly suggest this policy because if that beautiful big tree ever decides to let loose a limb, It'll crush your restaurant and everything in it, and you'll have to rebuild. And I look at it, and I say, you know, this is the year I'm not going to need it. Because when I do that, I'm going to need it. Exactly. So I did renew it, and I was, for the first time, very grateful I did that I renewed this policy that just says if this big tree ever crashes and crushes my restaurant, and I'm out of business, and I'm out of this, they're going to give me everything I need to rebuild. There you uh, go. So sometimes, sometimes you want to dance around the tree and hope that it finally falls, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Don't get me started. Hey, listen, when I promoted shows, uh, I did several uh, outdoor shows, and I always bought the rain insurance. And, I, and the way rain insurance works is it could rain enough to pay the insurance and still have the event. So I was always doing a rain dance, man. But uh, Pretty good. Speaking of rain, you know, my building in downtown Brunswick, that beautiful 4,100-square-foot, two-story ancient building it was built in the 1880s 1890s uh two stories beautiful we could run a beautiful studio out of there bill and uh i i'm still thinking what i want to do with it it's empty well <laughs> i'm gonna I be drove, i'm gonna be getting social security but by the time you make a decision so <laughs> I, I, I i forgot about that that's right we we did i took a tour i i told you oh this will be great uh, and then i haven't heard anything since now it's underwater now i know the trout are in there that's all i know that's right. we we could open up a fishing tournament let me tell you i drove past just before the storm hit us I think it was, uh, I had Kayla with me and her son, and we were driving through the city of Brunswick. Talk about the calm before the storm. It was ghostly, and there were police. You couldn't go somewhere. But the river started to rise. This was before the onset of the storm. And there's a small little thin river. Uh, that, that, that it's, it's an intercoastal river, of course. And when I say thin, I'd say maybe maybe tops, 50 feet wide. I drove past my building the other night. And this 50-foot-wide river, which is probably hundreds of yards away from my building, well, that little river looked like the Hudson River in its width. And my building was, uh, the first floor was probably two feet underwater. There was a flood all on the street. And I said, oh, my gosh, 
And so I'm going to have damage there. I'm going to have to talk to the same insurance adjuster who tells me to get this policy and that policy. <laughs> as long as he's not saying, I told you so, Sal. I told you you should have got that one for the bill. Well, you know, he's going to have a little tell, tell me so because I lowered the threshold on one of them uh, where it said my building was worth uh, so much money. I said, why am I paying this extra premium? I'm, I'm not even going to get that in the market if I lost the building because today's economy. And I lowered that. So that, that I, that I, that I uh, kind of... Uh, Step you know, it's funny. It's funny uh, when when for people that don't know about the Hudson River, what uh, Sal just alluded to, downstate and by Jersey, uh, by the George Washington Bridge, and uh, further downstate, uh, you know, below Albany, the Hudson River is is, is huge. It's wide. You know, I mean, yes. uh, big big boat. But if you come up in the Adirondacks where the Hudson River actually starts. I could take you, Sal, and I know it's hard for you to believe because the first time I drove over it, I, if I didn't see the sign, I would have went, you're kidding me. I could right. take you to a spot of the Hudson River that you could throw a rock across. Are you kidding me? I'm telling you, it's like it starts off as a stream, but uh, it's uh, it's amazing to know what that builds into. Anyway, let's, well, let's well, start. One more thing with that. I'm going to let you go, but listen. I often wondered is maybe the Delaware River has a similar mouth like that because I can't believe George Washington threw threw a coin across the Delaware River. He would have had a better pitching arm than any pitcher I ever knew. Well, it depends, you know. They also <laughs> they also said George Washington taught my guy Tom Molino how to fight, and uh, I, uh, I I searched that and and could not find any uh, substance there. But uh, I wonder if he really did chop down that cherry tree. But anyway, I don't know. But I wonder if he used the the wood from that tree for his teeth. That was <laughs> that's what he did. Uh, anyway, he did. He, if people don't know that, he had wooden false teeth. But uh, unbelievable. Uh, anyway, I mean, at least they took the bark off because somebody could if <laughs> well, they didn't. When so they were making it, it's like, hey, you got, you got, some, bark, yeah, bark, yeah, bark, you got, you got something on your teeth. I don't know. Is that a piece of bark? Nah, it's just a piece of bark. I, I have, a, I didn't get a chance to clean it. But uh, anyway, anyway, you know. So in, in the news today, before I read some emails, um, act, actually uh, over the weekend, um, a uh, writer, Josh uh, Katzowitz, um, wrote uh, an article uh, for Yahoo Sports, and uh, basically in it. Uh, Floyd Mayweather was quoted as uh, calling out Triple G, Sal. Um, I, you know, first, I tell you, it's gonna first, happen. first he says, first he says uh, uh, that Triple G should move up and wait. Uh, then he was uh, referring to the fact that uh, uh, <coughs> you know Triple G didn't look that great uh, against Kell Brook. He said a guy like Brook with decent boxing skills exposed. Uh, Triple G, this is what uh, Mayweather said. He says, I saw my nephew after the Kell Brook fight, and he said, uh, Triple G wasn't what I thought he was. He's cool. Uh, I told you he's got punch and power for his stationary target. Uh, then he said, uh, hey, uncle, uh, or uh, as uh, Floyd said, he, he referred to him as unk. Uh, he says, uh, you would have stopped him. You would have destroyed him. And uh, Floyd says, I said, uh, nephew, you ain't telling me nothing new. He was just a fan of uh, Triple G fighting stationary targets. Um, you know, I, I find it comical that uh, anybody would suggest that Floyd would destroy anyone, uh, let alone stop anyone. Uh, Floyd's style is not seek and destroy. He doesn't knock anybody out these days. Um, but, and all kidding aside, Sal, uh, you and I have talked about the uh, uh, ramifications of a, a pot, the possibility of a Floyd Mayweather versus Triple G fight. And to tell you the truth, I've said it as recently as yesterday's show. I do believe that Floyd Mayweather has the skill uh, to uh, to steal a victory from Triple G. And to be honest with you, Sal, I think that win, lose, or draw, if Floyd Mayweather challenged himself and and wanted to really make a statement about solidifying his legacy, putting an exclamation point. Uh, on his legacy, whether he wins, uh, loses, or, or fights to a draw, I think fighting Triple G would certainly do that. What's your thoughts? Well, you and I talked about it. In fact, I don't want to be so bold to call it, but I, I called that fight in the sense that I think that would be one of the only ways that you want to talk about a legend, you want to talk about a legacy, that, yeah, as you said, that Floyd Mayweather could really solidify his place in boxing history if he went out on a big boom and challenge triple g for the championship and i do agree with you i think he's got the style uh and the ability as you suggested to steal the rounds away from triple g 
I would look to see Triple G cutting off the ring more effectively to Manny Pacquiao and landing some of those big blows that could break an eye socket, and that would hurt Trip, that would hurt Floyd Mayweather. And uh, but needless to say, I would love, and that would be a fight I'd pay for. Because I'm telling you one thing, I see how how you called it. The night of the fight, we saw Mayweather and Pacquiao. You called the whole thing that's happening and coming to fruition. I'm just not excited about that fight because, like I said, I will give Mayweather, if they fought 100 times, Mayweather beats Pacquiao, 90 of them. Well, that fight, uh, listen, the, pay, the Ma- Mayweather-Pacquiao fight is going to happen, and it's going to happen in May um, of, t- of next year. Uh, uh, unless, for some reason, Manny Pacquiao does not beat Jesse Vargas. Um, and, and, and I don't think it's a layup fight. I, I think uh, Manny Pacquiao is going to have to have a, uh, a, an extremely good performance uh, against Jesse Vargas to beat him. I, I don't think that he's going to be able to just win a, a, a boring fight. I, I think Mayweather is going to have, I mean, I'm sorry, Pacquiao is Pacquiao. going to have to have a Pacquiao-esque performance, a dominating performance that will justify... Uh, and, uh, and 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 get Mayweather uh, to fight Pacquiao. Make no mistake, Floyd wants to fight Pacquiao. He's just afraid of all the negativity that uh, everybody is saying, how they don't want to see a second fight. But if Pacquiao beats Vargas convincingly, uh, the rematch will be made. It will take place in May. It was, uh, you know, a year off of what I, I predicted. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, you're right. I did say it that night, and I you still believe it's going to happen. Right my pizzeria. The yeah. night we saw that fight. Yeah. Hey, we got to talk, uh, by the way, we got to talk about the Kovalev fight, but, uh, whether we're going to do something on that. Because yeah, if I would we are, to, we, we got we to gotta start making plans. That's coming, dude, that's coming up faster than, than we think. Kovalev Ward. Uh, is in November. We're already halfway through. I, I can't believe by the time this weekend hits, we'll already be halfway through um, the, uh, uh, the 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 month of October, and we're almost halfway through the NFL season already. Uh, I mean, no man, way. yeah, time flies. Well, you know they play. Well, they're already they're playing this. This is they're playing a sixth game this weekend. They only play sixteen in two weeks. It'll be halfway through. So let me get an email here. Uh, and speaking of uh, uh, football, there, Monday. If, let me know if Hillary Clinton's emails turn up. Yeah, no, I, I, there's still <laughs> that, there's there's somewhere there's uh, I think sorry. forty thousand of them hanging around. <laughs> well, they got to turn up somewhere. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But uh, uh, speaking of uh, football and Monday Night Football last night, the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, topped the Panthers, who didn't have Cam Newton, by the way, who's still. Uh, going through the uh, concussion protocol, uh, the Bucks topped the Panthers seventeen uh, fourteen. So anybody that played the Bucks who were getting five points uh, won some money. And if they're a Bucks fan, like a kid I know, Mike, uh, they got the win too. Uh, and uh, FYI, the uh, under came in for all you guys that uh, <laughs> like to play. Uh, the the sports betting scene. Uh, speaking of uh, sports, how about Major League Baseball? Uh, we know what's going on with the uh, American League Championship Series. The Cleveland Indians uh, beat the Boston Red Sox 4-3 to uh, earn a spot in the ALCS, and they will be taking on the Toronto Blue Jays, the winner, moving on to the World Series. Over in the National League, uh, we still got some games to play. The Nationals uh, beat the Dodgers 8-3 to to take a 2-1 to uh, game series uh, over in the National League Divisional Series. And um, the other game, uh, the Cubs uh, uh, are uh, extending it uh, since the Giants beat them last night, six to five. Uh, the Cubbies lead uh, that two to one. Uh, as you guys recall, I, I predicted that it would be a Cleveland Indian against Chicago Cubs World Series, and uh, I still believe that that's going to be the case. So we'll have to wait and see. But uh, uh, I, you know, that's that's the Nostradamus in me, Sal. Um, you know, coming. Uh, I like uh, coming up. I like that effect. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I like it too. When I when I when I have <laughs> the right let amount. Know. Let me know. Yeah, you know, when when, <laughs> when I when I call it. Like Rodney Hey, let me know. Hey, hey, I, t- hey, I, t- I, t- I tell you right now, when I call it and don't put the money on it, and it comes up true, then I, you know I kick myself in the arse. Uh, when when I when I call it and then put the money on it and it doesn't come up, I kick myself in the arse. Uh, bottom line, I'm kicking myself keep, in the yeah, arse a lot. Like, a lot you of know, arse kicking. Yeah, I am. I am. But uh, my man Jesse says, hey, Billy C., 
Uh, is it me or is the NFL uh, games and teams just awful this year? It looks like there are a lot of bad games being played with a lot of bad teams. So far, the only teams that look exciting are the Raiders. My Niners season is already over, and they are frustrating to watch. Um, the Raiders are a great team to watch, and I'm excited uh, for the Raiders. And like I said yesterday, the uh, Oakland Raiders should just uh, spot the teams that they play a couple of touchdowns before the first kickoff because they're constantly coming from behind and winning. They only have one loss, and uh, they are a fun team to watch. Uh, I agree with uh, you, Jesse, that your 49ers – uh, are done, uh, but I feel you because so are my Jets. Um, but but here's the thing. I don't think that the teams are, are bad. I, I think that what you're witnessing in the NFL is continuity and the success of the salary cap and where uh, the NFL is moving. I, I think what you see is a lot of equal teams where one major piece of a, a, a puzzle of a team gets injured or is serving a suspension or, or something uh, to prevent them from getting on the field is what uh, dictates whether a team is, is winning or losing. Uh, you know, the teams that have a strong bench, so to speak, uh, fill-in players like the New England Patriots, uh, like the Buffalo Bills, uh, who are uh, showing that they're a solid team without a couple of their key players. Um, you know, I, those are the teams that excel. Um, the other teams, uh, they're just they're equal, but I, I don't want to believe that they're all bad. I, I really don't. Uh, so I, I don't know if I agree with you there. He says, I want to see San, uh, I want to see Diego uh, fight names like Adrian. Uh, he's talking about Diego Magladeno. Fight names like Adrian Estrella, uh, Derry Jean, uh, Cherry or Felix Jr. Because Jr. needs to step up his level if he doesn't fight Terry. Um, I, and, I, you know, Diego Magladeno... Um, I, you know, I, I think that he's a product of what Sal and I are always talking about um, with um, with coddling a young fighter too much. Uh, Magladeno had a very easy uh, path, and then as soon as they stepped up his level of opposition, he hasn't fared so well. So, you know, I, unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, fighters just need to be moved correctly. Sal, I mean, you, they got to have tougher fights earlier on. And we got to get away from this. If you lose syndrome, your career is over. I think that's the biggest problem. I think that's a very big problem. I mean, it started when I uh, saw the Olympic squad, the team in 1976 that was stellar. You had you had several gold medalists out of there that evolved to be some great fighters and world champions. And they came on and they built up some great undefeated records uh, early on. And it propelled them into uh, the, the contendership of uh, top 10 and then the world title shots. And I think from that model, you see a lot of the youth today, you know, versus uh, uh, looking back when a fighter would get a title fight, he'd, ha he'd have 50, 60 fights and maybe five, six losses, maybe more. And, uh, but he'd still get a chance. Today, they want to protect that, that O on their record to no end. And, uh, you know, I, I'd say if you're a gutsy fighter and you're willing to fight anybody, depending on who you lose to, that O is not going to be detrimental to your career. It might even give you an opportunity to get that title fight if they think, uh, you know, it's like the old movie scene from, uh, from uh, Jake LaMotta's life when he fought uh, that, that uh, Billy Fox or whatever, you know, hey, you, lose, you win, you lose, you lose, you win, either way you win. But it says I don't want to put that little bit of reality from his life into today's contemporary boxing. But the fact is, guys got to get in a ring. They got to fight. You know, versus my generation, we didn't care who we would fight. We would just want to get a fight and and show we're the best fighter out there. We wouldn't lose or draw. We're going to give it our all and we're going to try and beat anybody. We weren't afraid of competition. We weren't afraid of stepping up. We wanted to put our money where our fists were. And that was it. That was it. You just sought out the better competition. You sought out who was the baddest guy on the planet, and you would get in a ring with him. Well, that Win, was lose, or draw. You gave it your all. That was the mentality. That of... was the mindset. You're like a pit bull, like a like a like a lion. It was like you know they made the movie. What is it? When when, when we were kings. You know about the heavyweight trilogy and with Ali and Foreman and whole everybody. You know the bottom line is yes, that was boxing stellar era when we were kings. We went in that ring. And we felt we were the best that we could fight anybody in our weight division. 
And we were going to give our heart, our blood, our soul, our lives. That's the mentality and the mindset. We were we were fighting machines, and we didn't care who we were going to go up against. Well, today today our youth uh, got to be safe, safety first, youth, youth, safe, be, be safe, be safe. You know, yeah. you, you 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 don't want to get hit. You're you're a boxer, but you don't you know yeah you don't want to get hit at all. You know, but uh, and that's a good segue because. Uh, Jesse's next comment is, is Floyd trying to say, I don't want a Ryan Fitzpatrick saying I want $18 million when he hasn't earned or proved it? These fighters want all this money, but yet they have not fought anybody. I agree with that first show. Uh, I, I agree with uh, that first show it and you will get paid. And, and Floyd was uh, uh, interviewed uh, recently and in saying that uh, the fighters are, are demanding too much money. And he's right. I mean, he, listen. I'm not a Floyd fan, but Floyd puts fannies in seats. Well, he puts fannies in couch seats with pay-per-views, um, and you know he 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 earned it. He said he he sells the stuff. I mean, you, you can't deny that. And all yeah. these other fighters want all the money. They don't want to fight, and it's ridiculous. And that's why boxing's in the state that it's in, and that's why uh, uh, the PBC has been so bad uh, for the overall for the sport. It's been good. Uh, for us in terms of volume of fights, but it's been bad for the business. And I said, if you go back and listen uh, to our shows, I said that when the PBC fails, and Sal, I'm sure you could back me up on this, I said that when the PBC sa fails, it's going to take at least a year of, of a very slow uh, boxing world to regain, to reset itself, because you got all these fighters that are under contract with Al Heyman who haven't fought. You got guys that are demanding big time purses for nothing. You know they don't uh, they don't have any reason to do it. Uh, and you have networks now that have no interest in shelling out any money. Uh, so it's going to take a while to get it back uh, where it was. I, I believe that the pay per view uh, that Top Rank is is doing themselves, producing and and doing it themselves. Um, for the Pacquiao fight is going to be a step in the right direction, I think. I, I think you're right, too. And when you did say that, you did say that several times, you definitely had your Nostradamus cap on. That's right. I did. Yes. I, and I, if, if it, I need batteries for it now. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'd be wearing it. But uh, finally, Jesse says, Billy, it just seems it's going to be the Cubbies' year. Everything's going their way. But the other team that might push them is Toronto. How do you rate the team's favorite based on the playoffs so far? Um, I, I think that the two I, listen. I think that the two best teams are the Cleveland Indians and uh, and Cubs. And and the beauty of baseball versus football, a lot of times. Now, with that said, there is an asterisk because some teams come on very strongly at the end of a season and and just run with it. But generally, in baseball, with the exception of that one game wild card playoff, you're playing a series. So so you know the best team will win the majority of the time. So I personally don't like the five-game series, which the divisional playoffs uh, are, are in now. I like the seven-game series. But a, a seven-game series really shows you who's got the, the better team because they got to win four of seven games, or in this case, they, they got to win three of five. Um, so the teams that are truly better will win uh, those, those, uh, those um, games because – the truth of the matter is, is any one team can win one game. I mean, you could have a a, a good night, you know, uh, but to win three in a row or four in a row or win three out of five or four out of seven, uh, I think the best teams rise to the top. That that's that's my thoughts. What do you think, Sal? I think you're right. I think you're right. You you call it, Bill. I, I think, uh, you know, I can't disagree with anything you just said. I think it's right. We got it. Uh, I like to see some of these teams rise to the top as they are. We got a couple other emails. This one's from my man Chip, who always comes up with some good stuff. His uh, topic, his subject is Danny Jacobs, Gary Russell, and a sprinkle of Keith Thurman. He says Ooh. Al Heyman has played his part and further in further ruining boxing. Uh oh, and and I agree uh, with that. By the way, everybody thought that Al Heyman was going to save boxing, and the truth of the matter was was Al Heyman conned the the investors at Waddle and Reed. Uh, and he had these connections at Waddle and Reed to take the money that the investors uh, invested and put it in to his series, um, which uh, they spent like drunken sailors. And when the smoke cleared, the only people that made money 
was Al Heyman and the fighters that fought on the cards, which was a handful compared to the guys that all 200 fighters that Al Heyman signed did not fight on a PBC uh, series card. And, um, you know, the networks, uh, they enjoyed some big numbers, but they also watched them uh, get lower and lower and lower uh, as the year progressed. So really nobody made out except for, truthfully, except for Al Heyman. And you know, you, you mean the investors didn't get their money back? <laughs> no, they they haven't, <laughs> Sal. They lost five hundred million dollars, a half a billion dollars. Uh, Al Where Heyman. Where did it go? Now, Where did now, it go? I, to the Clinton Foundation? I, I, What's I, going I, on? I, I tell you right now. Al Heyman obviously can sell ice cubes to an Eskimo because uh, uh, you talk about a con man. You thought Hillary was a con woman. Uh, Al Heyman uh, obviously is the biggest con man since. Uh, I don't even want to say, but you know, uh, it's a shame too because he had a couple good fights in there. That we like, we enjoyed that mix. Yeah, no, it was, but but when you but, go back and look at it, yeah. you could count. Well, you the thought, great- you Billy, you called it. You're clear void. I mean, you really are because you called it a shell game from the get go. Yeah, but and- you you can name the great fights on one hand. I mean, Porter True. Thurman, Leo Santa Cruz, and and Maris. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you had some great. Uh, um, fights, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Leo Santa Cruz, Carl Frampton. Um, I don't think the Maris fight was part of PBC, but we had some great uh, fights. Um, but uh, but most of them were showcase. Most of them were showcase. Anyway, he says uh, Gary Russell Jr. and Daniel Jacobs are delusional. They are spoiled brats who were overpaid by Heyman. Uh, and he says in parentheses, really, Waddle and Reed. He says, uh, Heyman skewed the market by giving guys like three or four times what they were really worth for fights. Now that the money is gone and Heyman's about to lose his juice, these guys just don't understand that they have to come off, off their cloud and get back down to reality. You could throw Thurman into that mix, too, with his bogus open letter to boxing. That was the most BS letter I have ever read. Keith Thurman basically suggesting that he's uh, on everybody's top pound for pound list, which is a joke, and that he draws millions, and and I quote, I draw millions of fans uh, at Gates and television. So obviously nobody has shown him the the true numbers, but uh, yeah, Keith Thurman, I was a huge fan of Keith Thurman, and man, did that go sour. But uh, he also says Russell's uh, recent comments uh, overstate his worth. This guy has fought one world-class uh, uh, ranked fighter in his career. And uh, Danny Jacobs' resume is just bad. Even if uh, a $1 million offer, uh, if he doesn't take that, uh, he's clearly ducking Triple G. Uh, there's no question that Daniel Jacobs is ducking Triple G. Everyone that wants to get their name in print, Sal, says they want to fight Triple G. And then Triple G says, okay, let's fight. And I then, then, about, and then might come and, back and ask him if he wants to fight me. Well, then everybody else, uh, you know, says, oh, well, he didn't want to make the fight. You know, yeah, yeah, he didn't want to. And, and uh, this whole thing with Jacobs, uh, uh, that's, that's a joke. Because it's a joke, and tri- you called it yesterday when you talked about yeah, it. Yeah, Triple G is ready to fight him. I mean, come exactly. on, uh, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, anyway, thanks for the email, uh, Mitch. Uh, Very yeah, good, Mitch. Thank good you. One. We got another one. This one's, uh, excuse me, from uh, my man James, and he says, uh, um, Except for the Alvarez Smith pay per view, we've now gone three weekends with no boxing on regular. <laughs> you and I were talking about that. <laughs> he says when the PBC was active, we had boxing on multiple channels each weekend. Now that they're gone, you would think HBO, Showtime, or ESPN would step up uh, their game to fill the void. Um, you know, I, I I think that that has to do with what we're talking about, Sal. I mean, uh, the fighters are outpricing themselves. Yeah. Um, when they jumped ship, you know, you had HBO, which was the leader, and the whole feud between HBO and Showtime, a lot of fighters jumped ship and went to Showtime, they went to Al Heyman, and now Al Heyman is, you know, failing, obviously, you know, uh, I predicted they would be done by May of this year, I was off by six months, uh, but the truth of the matter is, is, uh, you know, uh, HBO is, is a business, you know, and, and now fighters are going to want to go back there, but they're going to be demanding too much money. I listen. Uh, I think that uh, basically, uh, my man James here and and uh, Mitch from the previous email are, are right that the fighters have to come down to reality. I mean, there has to be a bar set, Sal. 
Um, and, uh, you know, Floyd Mayweather, as much as, uh, you know, he may be worth the money, and I've said that he's ruined the sport because he's made painted this illusion that all fighters should fight uh, and get the maximum money for the least amount of risk. And although Floyd has been successful doing it, I don't think that that should be the norm. I think it's an exception. And uh, if fighters don't realize this, or if we don't get a crop of new fighters that are coming in willing to uh, uh, fight for, for less money, we're in trouble, Sal. Well, and that's the whole thing. You know, I, I, the purses and the size, you know, I, I remember fighting my first 10-round fight. Uh, I, I I think it was just for a couple thousand dollars. And, uh, you know, it's like, whoa. I'm, in the, I'm, I'm starting to get some money. <laughs> it's crazy. Sal, an, an ESPN main event, all right, um, yeah. uh, up until the PBC tried to, to do it, a main event P, uh, ESPN fighter uh, could count on getting somewhere between six and $8,000. That's it. Main event on ESPN. You know, uh, 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 a lower co-main event. You're, you're talking three to five. You know, I mean, I know my that- my first my pro debut was on ESPN. I had two pro debuts because the first one was a no contest against uh, uh, Gary Gamble and, and ended in a nasty butt that cost me sixty four stitches on my forehead and before the end of the third round. And uh, uh, we had uh, that fight. I think I got paid. Probably about four hundred and fifty dollars, and then my and, and that was on the undercard of Alexis Arguello in the Sands Casino, and then my next re debut, if you say, because that was a no contest, was uh, uh, on a Howard Davis Jr. undercard at the Sands, and uh, I got paid about four hundred and sixty dollars for that fight. Yeah, uh, I mean uh, when yeah. I, when I when I was promoting, I mean a hundred dollars a round was was what you were paying. Uh, for you know, four and six round fighters, basically, you know, and uh, now it's good math. It's easy math. Yeah, you all understand it. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> it is. It is. That's why I could never understand when uh, when you're like, hey, we need to change this fight to a six round. And I'm like, well, I want twice as much money. You know, it's only two rounds. <laughs> you know, and by the way, it's not going to go down anyway. You're going to knock this guy out. But uh, hey, you know what? I I think instead of calling you Rocky. We, we should call you Stitch, because I, what, every time you talk about a fight, you talk, oh, after that fight, I got 47 stitches. Oh, after this one, I, I still got the score from the hey, 90s. Hey, man, I got so many uh, stitches. I, 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 and if I lose my hair, you're going to be able to play tic-tac-toe. I got so many butts and stitches. I had over 230 stitches easily in my career. I could name them all. You look like, uh, uh, you know, Frankenstein, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, with all this. Sal, absolutely. Yeah, Frank and Sal. There you go, I Frank like and Sal. Like Perfect. Frank and Barry, I can start my own cereal, there Frank you, and Sal. That's what you should do. Oh. Oh That's what you should do. Last email. This is from my man, um, uh, Angel, from Madison, Wisconsin. He says, uh, uh, hey, this is Angel from Madison, Wisconsin. I know. I just saw that. He says, uh, will, will, will Major League Baseball ever let Pete Rose back in? What's your thoughts on wow. Pete Rose and Major League's baseball ban on him? You know, I, I, here's the thing. I was an assistant GM for a professional baseball team um, in an independent league. It wasn't affiliated. And, and, you know, we did win our World Series, uh, so to speak. It was the Northern League. Um, And um, I I will tell you this. On all levels of professional baseball, whether it's Major League Baseball and affiliates or independent leagues, um, the biggest rule that they have, and they have it in locker rooms, they have it on every contract, I mean, it, it is the most common line that you will find in major league, uh, in pro baseball, and most professional sports for that matter. And that line says, <clears throat> "You are not allowed to gamble on uh, baseball." You know, in this case, in baseball, you're not allowed to gamble. Gambling uh, will uh, remove you from this sport, and you'll be banned for life. I mean, it's all over the place. Okay, it is a rule that uh, has been going on ever since the uh, uh, the uh, Black Sox scandal uh, in uh, in the early 1900s, where uh, 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 the players uh, for the bookies threw a a World Series game and uh, were busted for it. And uh, they changed uh, the way, uh, you know, everybody, uh, the outlook on the sport. Uh, No gambling. However, with that said, I think in Pete Rose's case. A guy, and this is just my opinion, and the fact that he did 
admit to gambling on baseball, but he never bet against his team, which, in my opinion, kind of, and, and, and again, this is an asterisk because it's Pete Rose. <laughs> you know, he, he never bet on his team to lose. He, it showed what a competitor he was. And Pete Rose was an exceptional baseball player. He changed the I way uh, baseball w- was done. Uh, you know, the all-time hits leader. Uh, he was a guy with limited talent who overcame it because of, of the hustling and, and ultimately earning the nickname Charlie Hustle. Um, I, I, listen, I, for one, believe that Pete Rose should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I think that there is no doubt about it that he should be in there. I think uh, in his case, I know they're trying to make a statement, uh, but you're not talking about a guy that reached a, uh, a Hall of Fame plateau. You're talking about Pete Rose. You're talking about a guy that arguably no one will break his records. Um, this is uh, a, a guy that deserves to be in the Hall of Fame where future generations can uh, learn about him. Uh, and they should put uh, an asterisk uh, or a, a statement that says how many years he was kept out due to uh, the whole incident and document it so people know. Uh, but, yes, I believe that he should be in the Hall of Fame. What do you think about that, Sal? Wow. <clears throat> That's a loaded question, man. I, I, when you started talking about locker room talk, I thought maybe you were going to start going along the Trump route. But uh, uh, I think uh, – But all guys I, say that? All guys say, oh, man, I got a shot with her. Oh, I'm a famous yeah, guy. Easy, all easy, I got to do is grab her. Uh, you know, uh, come on. Long answer. Come on. Okay. <laughs> anyway. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I remember growing up in the Rivervale, Rivervale Little League system, and baseball was our life. All of us wanted to grow up and be a Yankee or a Mets. What, what, what Little player. League system? Did I say Rivervale? Oh, Rivervale. Oh, yeah, man. There used oh, to be gambling man. lines on the Rivervale Little League League all the time. I used to clean up on those guys. Were you, I know, were you really? part of that? <laughs> you could have. I think my father bet on half our games. Yeah. <laughs> he bet on anything. That's funny. <laughs> he never bet against me. That's um, it. So he, get, he gets in. He gets in. Absolutely. But, you know, he, he, was our, he was a legend. He was one of our, our idols. And, uh, and we looked up to him. We, we saw how, he, he was an explosive player. You just saw this, this, uh, this burst of energy, this, this hunger, this competitor, this desire, this heart to win. And, yeah, it set a good precedent and a good role model for us kids. And right up until we learned about gambling. Uh, but, but, you know. It's it's delicate, Billy. The guy, the guy definitely. If this, if this never happened, maybe yeah, he would have been first round right in there. But the bottom line is because of this whole incident, it does. I mean, rules are rules. I'm looking at coaches' comments in here, and it's it's it is. I mean, do you keep lowering the benchmark uh, just to make an accommodation of rules? I mean, well, the rules were set for. You're told, as you said earlier on. Do I think he belongs in there? I think he, he, he could. Maybe they should do. How long has it been? 20 years? 10 years? How long has it been? Oh, it's it's been a long time. I mean, I, you know, since he's played, 20 years at no, least. 20, 25 years and six. Yeah, yeah but, you know, the, the, there's so many other nasty individuals. In it. I mean, I a, a guy that. A guy that. Co- lesser, that lived. That, 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 that had a history of drugs, uh, wife beat. Well, how about. Alcohol, how about. I'll, this, I'll, that, I'll, everything else. I'll name one guy right now. Um, a, a guy that that uh, is a Hall of Famer. People talk about him and everything else. This guy was prejudiced. Um, this guy w- used to spit on people. He used to, he was a womanizer. He used to smack the hell out of every woman he he was with. And that's Ty Cobb. He was one of the ne- meanest, he, nastiest he, guys. He, you know, he and, has and, that and reputation, you know, bro. I mean, the thing is, is that you know, I, the Hall of Fame is 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 set up to put the 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 superstars of that sport. Uh, and, and enshrine them. It, it tries to keep out all the other stuff. L- look at, listen, you talk about Pete Rose being an idol for you growing up playing baseball. Of course he was for me too, but my sport, um, I, I, I veered uh, from the Little League level into football, and I played football, uh, you know, through high school. And, and the thing, and I'm still a huge football fan, you know, I, of course Joe Namath was my idol, but so was another guy. 
You know what his name was? O.J. Simpson. I loved O.J. Simpson. <laughs> okay, okay, All right? okay, okay, okay. And, I loved O.J. And, too, and, man. O.J., uh, I mean, I there was... Up, I grew listen. up aspiring to be a world champion and jumping over suitcases for... Uh, American Taurus, whatever it was. No, it was for Hertz, but uh, but he used to, it was r- rushing in the envelope in the uh, Absolutely. airport. Absolutely, but I, but, I mean, nobody oh, stepped over briefcases, suitcases oh, better than he did. Hey, oh, he could have been a high hurdler. Hey, nobody was in those Naked Gun <laughs> movies that were funnier than him either. No, but but the, I, it's still a, I'm still I'm still shocked when I see where he was. And where he is. Well, here here's the thing. O.J. Simpson. You never know where you're going to be until you're there. No, you know, no. no. <laughs> wherever you end up, there you are. But <laughs> wherever you go, there you are. But, uh, there you go. That's, uh, that's it. That's wherever you go, there you are. But but uh, but but the truth of the matter is, is O.J. was an, was an idol. He's in the National Football Hall of Fame. And uh, he got a little, he slipped, that knife slipped out of his hand and, and kind of bruised and, and cut uh, his wife and her boyfriend or whatever he was, a friend. And, uh, and he gets off of that, um, which uh, was a whole nother issue. Uh, but then the guy ends up going to jail for, for trying to steal his own stuff back. I mean, you know, karma's a bitch. But, but the truth of the matter is, is, yeah, you're right. He's sitting in a jail cell right now. Um, and uh, he's still in the Hall of Fame, and he was still a True. great player on the field. It doesn't mean uh, he Wait was, a, you know. What were there rules back then in the Hall of Fame handbook of football that said if you are uh, 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 prosecuted as a murderer or do this or steal your own uh, uh, trophies back, does that exempt you from the Hall of Fame? I don't know if there's that clause in there. No, no, no. I think that was the, that was why he's still in there. He says, oh, it doesn't say no. Hey, yeah, so I murdered a couple of people. Big deal. You know, it's not in there, you know. But uh, anyway, I, I think Pete Rose deserves to get in. I love Coach. He's my man, but I disagree with him. But, uh, well, you anyway. know, and, and maybe, maybe they're after a 30-year ban or 50-year ban or when he dies, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but, well, that's uh, the problem. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, chances are they are going to let him in after They're going to do it one day, but maybe when he dies. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's not fair. You know what I mean? Let him see well, it at least. I mean, he's in, he's in the, hey, he's in the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame. They let him in there. But uh, anyway, uh, update on Tyson Fury. The WBO has given him 10 days to show them why he should not be stripped of their heavyweight title. Um, uh, long rigmarole of rules and, and the whole situation. Uh, so the uh, process of stripping uh, Tyson Fury is uh, clearly underway. Uh, it appears to me, especially based on the announcement from Bob Arum uh, a couple of days ago that the Parker, Andy Ruiz, which is a total friggin' joke of a fight. Andy Ruiz doesn't deserve to be fighting the Pillsbury Doughboy, let alone uh, Joseph Parker, let alone for a world title. You know, it seems like the deal has already been done and they're just covering their ass. And, uh, you know, I, I personally think that, you know, everybody's entitled to uh, falling off the straight and narrow and they deserve another chance at least they should uh, make Tyson Fury champion in recess, let him get his act together, and then let him come back and fight whoever holds the temporary title. Um, and the, the sanctioning bodies can uh, collect their sanctioning fees because that's all it's about, ladies and oh, gentlemen. It's, about. it's hey. about the money. Hey, Sal, I've been promising since yesterday a quote from Jim Lampley. Yes, and, I want to hear it. Because- you know, Jim Lampley, Jim Lampley is a guy that um, I, I, you know, I, I respect immensely. Um, but I do. I, I, I do believe his time is, is done on HBO. I, I think that HBO needs to get rid of him and either bring myself and you in or yes, uh, pass the torch to someone else. I believe that uh, HBO needs to get rid of uh, Jim Lampley uh, and uh, Roy Jones Jr. Um, I, I just think that it's old. Uh, you know, Jim Lampley, he's been there forever. Uh, great guy, knowledgeable guy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need some new blood. Uh, HBO needs to, to change. Uh, that's my thought. However, this quote that I'm going to read uh, from Jim Lampley uh, pertaining to the PBC, I couldn't agree with more. And here it goes. This is from Jim Lampley. He says, and I quote, could it really have only been a year and a half? Now, he's referring to the PBC. It seems longer, and maybe that's because despite the extraordinary accumulation of talent and the seemingly abundance of money, competitive fights like uh, Leo Santa Cruz uh, versus Carl Frampton and Keith Thurman versus Sean Porter have been far and few in between. 
For the most part, the PBC stars have been given faint-hearted matchups against lackluster opponents, followed by long layoffs with predictable results in TV ratings and advertising sales. You might have thought Spence's windfall to audience of more than 6 million viewers on NBC time slot was just prior to Rio's closing ceremony would have given a PBC a rejuvenative uh, bounce. But in late September, NBC announced that two primetime PBC cards in December were dropped uh, along with uh, uh, three shows on, on the NBC Sports Network. If PBC dis disappears, there'll be a urge to see that as a, as a devastating loss. In truth, it was predictable. Nearly 40 years of delivery via subscription channels like HBO and Showtime have accustomed boxing's audience to be seeing a continuous story uninterrupted by commercials. On commercial television, the many dramas in the corners between rounds are visible only as tape flashbacks. As live entertainment, it's just not the same thing. Boxing's next shot in the arm will emerge gradually as the high-profile and highly skilled fighters on the PBC roster begin to achieve free agency and reintegrate into the upper landscape of boxing. In the best of all possible worlds, someday Keith Thurman and Errol Spence will match up along with Terence Crawford, Deontay Wilder will fight uh, Anthony Joshua, and Adonis Stevenson will at long last face Sergey Kovalev. The path to that goal will require the unique brand of ingenuity, bravery, and passion that fuels real boxing promoters, people who are capable of doing one of the world's hardest jobs. As we can see it now, there's a great deal more to it than merely raising and spending $500 million. That wow. was a quote from Jim Lampley and Sal. I couldn't agree with the way it was worded and the way it was said more. I applaud Jim Lampley for that. And uh, and to tell you the truth, uh, he is he is same, he, same he, he, listen. Tell you what. He's dead nuts on Sal. What do you think? Dead, dead nuts on. I like that. Dead nuts on. That's like what Marissa Tomei said. Uh, say and that uh, Vinny, uh, my cousin Vinny. I don't know. I couldn't stop drooling over Marissa Tomei <laughs> in, 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 that, in, 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 in that movie know, or any time else because she still looks just as hot as she did in she, that movie. She is a beautiful, oh my and a God. nice, beautiful Italian girl from Brooklyn. Hey, if she's looking for a slightly overweight, balding, older Italian guy, I'm available. You know, I, I mean, you know, for, if, for you a know. Little, little younger, uh, hairy headed. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Anyway. I don't know. I think that uh, those words from Jim Lampley uh, were right on, deadbolt right on, and uh, I agree with him one hundred percent. And it was very good the uh, way he just uh, the words were were uh, put together. Excellent. excellent. You know, I, in in this sport of boxing, Sal, yeah. which um, you know uh, when you go back uh, to boxing when it was in its heyday, and and many people agree that the heyday of boxing really. Uh, was in the uh, 30s and 40s, and then the resurgence came back in the 60s and 70s, and it kind of ended in the 80s. Um, you know, th those were those were the big heyday. Although um, a lot of people feel that in the early 1900s, the heavyweight division was at its best ever during Jack Johnson and James Jeffries era. But um, for the most part, I think most uh, boxing historians agree that uh, the 30s and 40s, and then 60s, 70s, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the okay. end, you know, ending in the 80s uh, yeah. was, uh, you know, the best time for boxing. And, you know, what it's evolved into now and with the way that the sport has been divided and the division has taken place with uh, sanctioning bodies, uh, all infiltrating boxing, uh, everybody's got a title. We got situations going on like with the WBO and, and Tyson Fury and letting guys that clearly don't deserve a, a shot at a title to win a title to not only get a shot but to win a title uh you got guys like al Heyman who uh you know basically uh took a pile of dog shit and painted it and told everybody it was gold and people believed it um and uh basically he stole 500 million dollars from waddle and reed and uh got nothing in return the idea was was weak uh i don't think any of us uh, believed it would work. The model that he had, he had us all guessing. We, we were wondering what he was going to do, and, and we came up with ways where it could have worked. 
but uh, he stayed uh, true and fast to his uh, smoke screen. Uh, and uh, the end result now is you got two, 300 fighters that are under contract to Al Heyman who haven't fought. Uh, you got uh, TV dates that don't exist. You have networks that have vowed never to air boxing on it again. And as we close out 2016, you know, and, and we do have a couple of good fights on the horizon with, uh, you know, Sergey Kovalev and Andre Ward. Uh, Triple G is fighting again, hopefully against Daniel Jacobs. Uh, you know, I, we do have a couple of good fights to close out the year. Uh, 2017 looks really fuzzy, and 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 Sal, like I've said from day one, you know, to regain from from this PBC disaster, and it was a disaster. Even though we enjoyed watching it on TV, like the email I got earlier from my man James suggests, you know, and I'll be the first one to admit I love watching uh, boxing on TV uh, multiple times a week and gu guaranteeing that I'm going to see something every weekend. It's going to take a while for it to recoup. And, and I said when PBC failed, it would take almost a year. And I, and I still believe that that's going to happen. It, it appears that 2017 is going to be weak. What do you think? I, I, right now, I think you're right. There's, unless we have some big bouts and, you know, like I was saying when we first talked about a possible Mayweather Triple G fight, I think the media has got to create and stimulate what fights we want to see and listen to the fans and, and what makes the most common sense. So I think you and I should start talking about some big fights that we can put together for 2017 and see if we can make them come to fruition. Sal, there you go. Sal I'm not going to talk to you about anything until you're ready to pull the trigger because, <laughs> because I have a whole series that we could do um, oh, that man. Uh, you and I could put some serious well, things. Well, hey, listen, it, it. It, it, we could do it. We ha we know how we would do it. We've already discussed it. I know it would work, but it would take investment dollars, and it would take um, you know the the patience. It, it would take us a year to build something up before uh, revenue would be coming in. But at the end of that year, not only would we have revenue stream coming in, we would have a product that would not only benefit the fans, the boxing fans, but I truly believe that it would benefit the sport. And uh, uh, what, a, what a nice chapter to end your book on, huh? I would love to because we're going to start that book. And I'll tell you what, we can save boxing. You and I have the formula. You and I have talked about this. And we can actually resurrect and save boxing. Unlike the Heyman, which when you were talking about him, I uh, that what was that song that came to my mind was oh take the money and run but yeah anyway, um, <laughs> yeah but listen I, with five hundred <laughs> li all I'm saying is this I don't need that much no, you, you and I don't need it. that much you and I don't need that much okay I mean I could I could map it all out and we could sit and talk but 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 the truth of the matter is is if I would had available five hundred million dollars I could have saved boxing. And we could have done it in a much more reasonable way. Al Heyman spent that, it seemed to me, uh, it's like a drunken sailor. He had all this money and he spent it as quickly as he could. And the idea that people would flock to the sport was, it was ludicrous. I think that Al Heyman is an extremely intelligent man. And yeah. his background proves it. His education proves it. And because of, of, of my feeling of how intelligent I believe he is, is I don't think for a minute that he was trying to come up with a system that was going to work uh, anything other than putting an extra several million dollars in his bank account, which he successfully has done. There is no way just by having an open checkbook that that equals success, especially in the sport of boxing, Sal. Well, I'll tell you what, Bill. I, like I said, there's some greed that don't that doesn't fill the need, and and you know I think what was so interesting about his concept and about his matchmaking and his showcasing uh, was that it gave light to the to, to some people that didn't know the mechanics of how it would fail. So on the surface, it gave the the uh, boxing fans a, a nice light to look at but deeper down when you look at the people that know boxing no business and know everything else we knew it was going to be a failed system 
And, uh, you know, that's the whole damn thing. No, well, we knew I, we knew it was going to be failed the way he did it. it the way it, he did it. it let me it, tell you something. If he, if he would have done, it, he missed an important step. If he yes, would he have, did. if he would have had all those deals, because obviously he has the juice and the connections that most people don't. He was able to put boxing on networks that never had it before. If he took and and put uh, those events, same same scenario that he followed, right? Same yeah. scenario, buying the time and doing all the, the the crazy stuff he did, rather than hope that the networks were gonna have a. a you know, uh, uh, enlightening, uh, come to Jesus moment, uh, and say, yes, Mr. Heyman, we're going to pay you now next year for you to bring that show to us because they knew damn well that nobody was sponsoring it or anything else. Um, if he would have taken and developed these fighters, introduced these fighters to, to the public and then came back every month or every other month with a great matchup, a la Carl Frampton, and uh, Leo Santa Cruz or Sean Porter uh, and Keith Thurman, etc., and make those pay-per-view events. Now, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I'm not. I'm not saying I want to keep paying for pay-per-view events, but that would have been a model that generated the revenue he needed to at least make some money. He's lost five hundred million dollars, Sal. I know. Well, I know. And believe me, you give us a chance with the, with half that money. I think we can make it a go. Okay, yeah. Listen, I don't even. Movement. I don't even need. I don't even need one fifth of that money. No. to, to and, do and what you we know what? Well, do. we can forget about it. I mean, five hundred million dollars. That's a hell of a lot of money. Sal, you got you got the money to make it all work. I mean, give me a break. You. I mean, for what we could do it for, and what we were talking about, it could do. It could happen. But hey, speaking of pressure. Coach is putting pressure on you right now. He's checking the dates for the fight. I mean, he's ready to come down and uh, and be part of our uh, event. Coach, we'd love to see you, pal. We've got a whole menu for you, and we'd love to have you and your wife and, and just come on over and and let's uh, let's see. And and, he's not uh, coming unless you bring the fight. I mean, come on, let's be real. Oh, yeah. The place is ravaged from the hurricane. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's not just coming down for dinner. He's I coming down say, for the whoa. fight. He's coming down for a freak of those. Yeah, yeah, he's coming. He's coming all the way from Long Island for a free cannoli. Now you know those cannolis got to be good if Coach it's is going to come good. all the way from Long Island, which incidentally has some pretty damn good cannolis themselves uh, to go to Sal's. I mean, come on, you know, Sal. We got a pretty good Long Island right here. I mean, come <laughs> on. But uh, anyway, hey, Sal, listen, uh, uh, it was uh, fun today, and uh, uh, we got uh, you know a slow day in boxing. We got another slow uh, weekend uh, scheduled uh, for boxing on TV, and uh, like I said, the, the really the next big fight is the Kovalev Ward fight. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, we're limited at what we can talk about, but rather than beat a dead horse, uh, we'll uh, we'll wait for tomorrow. We got a lot of good stuff scheduled for tomorrow. We got our blast from the past. We got Larry Hazard. We got you coming on. Uh, we got uh, maybe some updates that we can talk about with the heavyweight division and uh, uh, some other stuff, and uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I mean. Uh, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. We got uh, uh, other sports going on. We, uh, right now, all the sports are happening. At this time of year, you got the beginning of uh, hockey and uh, the NBA in their preseason, and you got NFL in full swing. You got Major League Baseball closing it out with their playoffs and ultimately World Series. Uh, uh, everything's cooking except boxing, Sal. So uh, we got we, we got a lot we could talk about. Absolutely. And you know what? You want to know something? I can almost guarantee. We're not going to have to listen to another lawnmower for a couple of weeks. Yeah, well, that, that's good. That's good. You know, and then during the show, I, you know, obviously we had some kind of catastrophe here, uh, ambulances in the background and stuff. But uh, at least I know they weren't coming for me. You know, I'm, I'm still alive yeah, and well, at least today. But uh, anyway, hey, Sal, uh, it was uh, great uh, having you on. I'm glad uh, you're safe. I'm glad everything is in good shape uh, down in uh, St. Simon's. Uh, and uh, all I could say is this. I hope uh, uh, everyone uh, makes sure that they... Tu oh, I want to give everybody an update on Fight TV. Uh, it's uh, kicking some butt. Uh, we're going to have a link up, up, up on our website shortly uh, that will get you directly to it. Plus, I'll be able to direct you to a link on your handheld device. So uh, make sure you check that out uh, as soon as I get it uh, up and running. Fight.tv for your handheld device. You can watch... Uh, this show and uh, everything to do with combat sports on Fight TV, which we're part of, and uh, we're glad to be part of that. So I just wanted to give uh, everybody a, a, a shout-out uh, 
uh, there and make sure you uh, tell them that you want uh, more of the Billy C show uh, and uh, just so that they know that you're uh, tuning in to Fight TV to watch us. And that's, uh, that's important, right, Sal? I think that's a great model to adhere to, and I, I think that couldn't have been said or said any better, either, even by Lampley. No. Yeah, even by Lampley, <laughs> or or your idol Hillary Clinton. But uh, anyway, yeah, ah, let me cl- easy, let me easy. let me let me close with that. You know, I knew me, I knew that that would ruffle Sal's feathers. It did. You just you just I, gave it, me chills the opposite way. I think some <laughs> of his I think some of his I think some of his stitches just burst open. You know, <laughs> I, did. I just reopened something. I, th- I, I think you, I think he's bleeding now. I think he's bleeding looking now. Looking like Frankenstein. Frank and Frank Sal. I like that. I like Frank and Sal. I like that better. Frank and Sal. Frank and Sal. I can tell you, we're going to make a cereal, Bill. Frank and Sal. We'll have the little the little cereal pieces made in shape of boxes. I, I would, I would say, up. I would say, let's get a T-shirt. But everybody keeps emailing me, wanting to see pictures of T-shirts, wondering where that T-shirts are. I said, listen, if I were you, I'd go to another store. I'd forget about Sal. I you mean, know what? I got to get that one out that you told me about. I got to look for that email, and uh, I got to call that guy, see if he still wants it. I know Joel's he still wants it. The guy, he, a nice autograph picture. He emailed me, and my man Matthew. He emailed me. He's like, well, where's that green shirt? What's going on with Sal? I said, oh, sorry, man. He's, uh, you know, Sal. <laughs> Recovering from a storm. Yeah, and, and, hey, I, I just want to say, if I can, Billy, because I know he's listening, and uh, he does a lot behind the scenes for our show down here. He promotes it quite a bit. That's my pie guy in our business, Max, Max Williams. He's also a sports buff, and uh, and uh, he he stayed on the island. He bunkered down and hunkered down in his little, little uh, uh, cabin and fortress that was probably uh, uh, lined up for, for serious storms, and he... Uh, he was able to give me daily updates of what the status of the restaurant, the island, and everything else was. So we're going to try to reopen today. This is the day they're going to let people come back on the island. And uh, so we're putting it all together. But I want to thank Max for uh, keeping a good eye on the place and uh, making sure that uh, everything was uh, going to be in a position to, for us to reopen today. Well, the truth of the matter is you think I come down to Sal's for you. I come down to, to, to hang out with my man Max because uh, – Aside from you, Sal, nobody makes a better pie than Max. And uh, one thing I, I do want to send out my condolences to my man Max uh, for the Bulldogs. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure. Oh he's, boy, that's I'm sensitive. Su- I'm, I'm sure. Sensitive I'm subject. sure. I'm sure Whoa. he's uh, still in mourning uh, <laughs> over that uh, fiasco against Tennessee. But uh, don't worry, Max. My boys, the Alabama Crimson Tide, will get back at the Tennessee Volunteers this weekend when we kick their butts on Saturday. So uh, uh, I think that Max should consider uh, being uh, uh, an Alabama fan um, for this weekend. And for some reason, it looks like we just lost Sal. Uh, But listen, uh, the show uh, uh, has come to an end. So make sure that you guys uh, tune in tomorrow morning. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, ciao, baby.